Section fifty five of the Early Diary of Francis Burney, Volume One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sunday night, June the twenty sixth. Mamma with Bessie and Dick are gone for a few days to Bradfield on a visit to Mrs. Young. A message came this evening while my father and I were tete a tete in the study from Mr. Coney of Lynn with compliments and that he was coming to pay a visit here with an intimate friend of my father's not conjecturing who this might be and knowing that mr coney did not merit the sacrifice of an evening word was sent that my father was not at home but they left home before the messenger returned and were therefore told the same tale at this door However, they came in to see me, Mr. Coney first, and then Mr. Bewley, my father's very learned and philosophical friend, who's come to town only for this one evening. I protest I was quite confounded at the sight of him. I knew well that my father would as earnestly desire to see Mr. Bewley as he had not to see Mr. Coney. I was upon the point of saying to Le Bon, at sight of him, Mr. Bewley, my father, is at home. But the recollection of the third of a second told me what a gross affront that would be to Mr. Coney, whose name had already been sent, and without success. I therefore restrained myself, and to my great concern, after about a quarter of an hour spent in chatting, I was obliged to suffer Mr. Bewley to march off in the same ignorance with his companion. My father has since sent half the town over in search of Mr. Bewley, but in vain, for I could not procure from him any satisfactory account of his place of abode, which indeed he did not seem to know himself. He was so extremely distray during the visit that I believe he was uncertain whether he was in Queen's Square in reality or in a vision. Mr. Coney, who piques himself upon having the address of a man of the world, and who was very conceited, gave himself the air of being diverted at Mr. Bewley for his absence and ignorance of the town, etc. He protested he had done nothing but laugh since they arrived. Ah, thought I, my merry gentleman, However, you may presume upon your external acquirements. That quiet, unassuming man who makes your diversion may also from you receive his own. Footnote. Although William Bewley was a poor and hard-worked surgeon in an almost unknown country town, he was in correspondence with the chief anatomists and writers on chemistry and electricity of his time. Illness took him to London to consult for himself, those to whom he had often written on the maladies of others. Under Dr. Burney's roof he revived, and had the delight of being presented to Johnson as the proud owner of the tuft of bristles from the doctor's old hearth broom. Back to main text. I've been interrupted by a visit from Dr. Armstrong. He must be very old and looks very much broken, but he still retains his wit and his gallantry. When I regretted my father's being out and thanked him for coming in to see me, to you, repeated he, shaking my hands, do you think there is anybody I would sooner come in to see than you? Speaking of physicians, I said, that it appeared to me to be the most melancholy of all professions, though the most useful to the world. He shook his head and said that, indeed, he had never been happy till he was able to live independent of his business, for that the pain and anxiety attendant upon it were inconceivable. But now let me come to a matter of more importance and at the same time pleasure. My brother is returned in health, spirits, and credit. 
he has made what he calls a very fine voyage but it must have been very dangerous indeed he has had several personal dangers and in these voyages of hazard and enterprise so i imagine must every individual of the ship captain cook was parted from in bad weather accidentally in the passage from the society islands to new zealand in the second and so fatal visit which they made to that barbarous country where they lost ten men in the most inhuman manner my brother unfortunately for himself was the witness and informer of that horrid massacre mr rowe the acting lieutenant a midshipman and eight men were sent from the ship in a boat to shore to get some greens the whole ship's company had lived so long upon good terms with the new zealanders that there was no suspicion of treachery or ill-usage they were ordered to return at three o'clock but upon their failure captain furneaux sent a launch with jem to command it in search of them they landed at two places without seeing anything of them they went among the people and bought fish and jem says he imagined they were gone further up the country but never supposed how very long away they were gone at the third place it is almost too terrible to mention they found footnote captain furneaux writes mr burney having returned about eleven o'clock the same night made his report of a horrible scene indeed which cannot be better described than in his own words here in cook's voyages follows the report of lieutenant burney who did not witness the massacre but found the remains of Rowe and the crew fanny has left the greater part of her page blank with the intentions seemingly of giving details but she may have found them quote, too terrible as they are both terrible and horrible we do not give them back to main text mr crisp to miss burney chessington august the twenty second dear fanny you were a good sort of girl enough and i don't hate you violently you kept me in hot water about jem though for a minute which small penance as you love mischief at your heart and cannot help it i can forgive since you set matters to rights in three or four lines afterwards but i see in the papers that a lieutenant clerk is to go out next voyage with the command of the resolution how will jem like that instead of his favourite captain cook or is it all one to jem who he goes with so that he does but once more visit tahiti and his dear peace that he left behind there but i wish him good luck with all my heart for i have taken a great fancy to him i suppose that rogue your father is at buxton before now have you heard from or about him let me know i wish i had anything from hence to keep up the ball of correspondence but in short instead of offering to pay your balance i can only send you an order for more goods to say that i and ham and kate have much missed you and would much rather have you again is or at least ought to be no news to you it is true however adieu your sincerely s crisp the present lion of the times according to the author of the placid man's term is omi the native of tahiti and next to him the present object is mr bruce a gentleman who's been abroad twelve years and spent four of them in abyssinia and other places in africa where no englishman before has gained admission his adventures are very marvellous he is expected to publish them and i hope he will he is very intimate with the strangers and one evening called here with miss strange his figure is almost gigantic he is the tallest man i ever saw 
could note Bruce was six foot four, back to main text, but well made, neither fat nor lean in proportion to his amazing height. I cannot say I was charmed with him, for he seems rather arrogant, and to have so large a share of good opinion of himself as to have nothing left for the rest of the world but contempt. Yet his self-approbation is not that of a fop. On the contrary, he is a very manly character, and looks so dauntless and intrepid, so that I believe he could never in his life know what fear meant. September the 1st My father received a note last week from Lord Sandwich, to invite him to meet Lord Orford and the Tahitan at Hinchinbrook and to pass a week with him there, and also to bring with him his son, the lieutenant. This has filled us with hope for some future good to my sailor brother, who is the capital friend and favourite of Omai, or Omaya, or Omi, or Jack, and my brother says that he is called by all those names on board, but chiefly by the last appellation. Jack. End of section fifty five.